When we sing Jesus be enthroned, we're just lining up our wishes and desire because he's already enthroned, right? And no one's pulling him off the throne. Hey, Miriam, good to see you again. Hey, I've got some announcements that you need to be aware of. Uh, first of all, if you notice this strange individual up here, his name is Adam Parmenter, and this is his wife, Marge, and they are keeping an eye on Dean and Linda to make sure that they behave and are walking the straight and narrow. So we appreciate that. But what is also interesting is now we are one brick shy of a sojourn. <laughs> Did you get that? I worked hard on that. <laughs> yeah, don't quit your day job, Kohler. Um, this will be the last work day that we have today until fall. Um, and so we're going to be doing some outside work. we got some weeding and things like that. If you'd like to stay, we'll feed you, and then we'll get you out of here by 2 o'clock. We still could use some help. If you have a friendly face and you'd like to say hi to individuals as they're coming in on a Sunday morning, we could use you as a greeter at the Welcome Center. Just let Kim know. Um, we still could use some child care volunteers uh, for Wednesday's Bible study meets from 9.30 to 11.30. So if you would like to serve or are able to serve, just let Kim know in the office as well. And I don't see Vicki here, so I wonder how her granddaughter went. Um, oh, if they didn't do it last Sunday? Oh. Ah. So she's make yeah, so some, someone made me look bad. Okay, because I said it was today, and she's nodding her head like, okay, she's probably thinking, you have no clue what's going on, which I don't, but that's all right. 
And keep in mind during prayer time, uh, Roberta Newton, who's 95, and she fell and broke her femur. And uh, so she had surgery yesterday. Surgery went well. Uh, her daughter said um, she's overall in good spirits, but after a couple days, they're, they're going to have to you know, put her in for some rehab. So keep her in prayer as well. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on today's service. Father, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to be here today on this sunny Sunday morning. We are thankful that you are enthroned, for you are the King of kings, you are the Lord of lords. We are your servants, your children. So help us today to bring you the honor and the glory that you are due. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing this, I believe. name 
stay, stay standing with me for a few more minutes. Let's read God's word together this morning while we're standing. Today we're reading from Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the seas, O Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You may have a seat. We're going to do something we haven't done in maybe three years now. We're going to do a new song. We're going to play a new song and hope to have you learn it with us. So this is a song from a, a group in a church that you've probably heard of, Elevation Worship. Stephen Furtick is the pastor there out of North Carolina. And um, we do other songs from this group. And so uh, the words here are really quite simple. It just says that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have power over everything in our lives that could throw us off. So in a world where we struggle, everyone struggles every day with fear and anxiety. As Christians and believers, we have faith and power in God because he conquered the grave. He's still alive today in our lives. So that's what this song is about. Listen along. If you do know it, please sing along with us. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. All creation waits with the
empty grave for the risen one is overcome we will not be moved when the earth gives away for the risen one is overcome and for every fear there's an empty like those kind of promises. Sometimes the enemy would look at us and say, you really believe that? And I get to say, yes, I do. So I want to confess something to you. I like to breed. I really do. You know, I never thought about it much until I was about 20 years old and, uh, I was in a house that had cats as pets. I don't know why. <laughs> After being, I know. <laughs> I know, because my wife will slap me otherwise if I say what I really think about cats. Anyway, after being around them for a while, I noticed a certain tightness in my lungs. And... Um, I noticed that I wasn't able to breathe as easily as I did, and so someone suggested maybe you are having an allergic reaction to the cats, which I thought was strange. I never was allergic before, but I didn't know that you can grow in and out of allergies. And so we drove by a, a drugstore, and I got some uh, an, an inhaler, primatine mist from the drugstore, and a couple shots later, I was good to go. What a difference. Um, it still puzzles me. I, I keep waiting. This was like over 40 years ago. I keep waiting for the time that I might grow out of my allergy to cats, but such has not been the case. Uh, sometimes it could take hours. I mean, I could be in someone's house that would have a cat, and I might be good like for a couple hours, and then I'd be noticing it and say, okay, honey, time to go. And at other times, man, half hour, that's it. I mean, on a couple occasions, I've been in someone's house that had cats, and I was lucky to be able to make it home, you know, and thinking, oh, my goodness. And that's like, are you going to make it? Are you going to make it? we got to go to the emergency room? And, and so usually I, if I'm going to someone's house that I know that has cats or had had cats in the past, by the way, if you invite me over and you say, hey, but I, I put my cat in the room or, sorry, the previous owners had cats, it doesn't matter. Somehow that dander or whatever it is about cats will find its way into my lungs. And so I keep a rescue inhaler with me usually when I, when I do that. Um, so it's not any wonder that I like to breathe. But I also know that God designed us to breathe, right? I mean, uh, and what's cool about it is I don't have to think about the process. I just stand, I just exist, and... I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out, I'm breathing in. I don't have to consciously make my diaphragm contract to pull air into my lungs. You know, I don't have to think about relaxing my diaphragm so that air can be forced out of my lungs. Now, I know that that's a simplistic explanation of how the mechanics of breathing work, but the point is under normal circumstances, I have to think very little about the whole exercise of breathing. We just do it. As believers in Christ, there are some things that we should just do, like breathing, without ever having to think about it, without consciously saying, this is something I should do. I suppose you can think of some of those, but I think one of those things should be prayer. It should be just something that we do. Now, I know that I've talked about prayer on a number of occasions in the past. In fact, 
during my tenure here over the last 20 years. I did three series of messages on prayer, and therefore I know you might be thinking, well, why would someone want to address this subject again? I mean, you already talked about it three different times, and I have an answer for you. I want to address it because we can all improve in this area. All of us. I don't care who you are, how good you pray, how long you pray. All of us can improve in this area in our lives. Now, typically, if I were to ask you one area in your relationship with God that could improve, I know that two answers would probably come up. One would be prayer life, and the other would be, oh, I wish I could read my Bible more often. I wish I was more disciplined to do that. And I know that there might be a healthy debate as to which one uh, most of you would say. Would it be, I don't read my scripture enough, or I don't pray enough? And I don't want to get into that kind of debate, but I do want to just talk about prayer because it should come naturally. Even without thinking, we should just do that. Why do I want to address it? Well, I think God has wired us to pray. You see, when God created man, he created man with this ability to be able to communicate with him, right? We get to talk to the creator of the universe. We were created to have a relationship with him. And if you've ever had relationships, especially if you're in a marital relationship, what is one of the key components of any relationship? Say communication. You are absolutely right. Absolutely right. Communication is essential in any relationship, but especially with God. And so... In a very generic sense, we would say prayer is communication with God. Now, interestingly, the Bible does not define prayer. Did you know that? It gives us examples of prayer. It tells us who should pray. It gives us uh, examples of when and where one should pray. It gives us examples of how one should pray. It gives us examples of different kinds of prayers. It gives us examples of prayer postures. It gives us examples of what we should pray for. It tells us to whom we should direct our prayer, but it does not define what prayer is. And so it's my intention this morning to answer not only the what question, what prayer is, but why we should pray. And so as such, I'm going to address the what Question first, what is prayer? Again, I'm not certain that anyone could come up with a definitive definition of prayer that everybody on the face of the planet will agree upon. In the systematic textbook that we use in our theology class, uh, it defines prayer in this manner. Prayer is a personal communication with God. Now, as you can see, this is a very broad, broad definition. And it's a good definition, but I want a little more substance. The Holman Bible Dictionary says, Prayer in the Bible involves the dialogue between God and people, especially his covenant partners. Obviously, Holman believed in covenant theology. And this is a pretty good definition as well, I believe. And common to these two definitions is the aspect of communication. Communication. The dictionary defines uh, prayer as the ability to communicate with a person or a deity. I came across some simplistic, kind of almost cutesy definitions of prayer. Prayers are direct line to God. Or Prayer is talking to God, or prayer is paying attention to God. Not bad. A little too cutesy for me. But I suppose we can get into a more elaborate definition of prayer. One of the questions, number 178 of the Westminster Larger Catechism defines prayer, and it answers the question, what is prayer? And they define it this way. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. What a mouthful. (laughs) 
And I expect you all to memorize that. We'll have a test on that next week. I mean, this definition to me sounds very, very academic. It defines prayer to a degree, but I think that it also includes some aspects of prayer that seem to go beyond just a simple definition. But then again, who am I to question the Westminster larger catechism? While I don't consider myself a theologian of, of any significance, I've reflected on uh, what I know about prayer, and I've come up with a simple definition. Maybe you'll like it, maybe not, but I'm going to share it with you anyway because I can. Prayer is the communication aspect of our relationship with God, whereby we share our hearts with Him. I think it's simple. I think it's easy to understand. It doesn't include technical aspects of prayer. It simply defines what it is. Communication, an aspect of our relationship, because relationship includes more than just communication whereby we share our hearts with him. This communication, the sharing of our heart with him, is something that is deep, something that is personal. It's not superficial. It's not trivial. Sharing our hearts with, with, with God means that we can bring anything, anything in the world to him in prayer. I'm going to keep this definition before you throughout this message because I don't want you to forget what prayer is. So let's take some time and move beyond the question of what prayer is to why pray. Why should we share our hearts with God? And the answer to this is something that I just mentioned a while ago. God has wired us. God has wired man to communicate with him. He's given us the ability. He wants us to communicate with him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And as I had already mentioned, communication is essential to all relationships. Do you realize that the first person who ever lived, Adam, did not communicate firstly with his wife? He communicated with God. He had a conversation with God even before Eve was created. Logic would tell me that there had to be communication between the two, especially when God brings the animals before him and he expects Adam to go ahead and name all the animals. And so, yeah, I know I might be reading something into it, but, you know, to me it just seems that there had to be a conversation there between them as God explains what he wants Adam to do, and Adam responds to what God requested of him. We, would, we could call that communication prayer. I mean, I don't see why we shouldn't. I want to give you a short six-word reason why I think we should pray. Prayer expresses our dependence on God, our dependence on him. Now think about this for a moment, will you? I mean, think about the implications of this statement because I think that they're, they're profound. Prayer expresses our dependence on God. Do you know what that means? Prayer's not for God's benefit. Prayer's for our benefit. For our benefit. There are certain aspects of human communication or conversation that don't apply to God. For example, we talk with others for informational purposes. We talk with someone to instruct them or to correct them. We talk to someone to share what may be on our minds or what may even be on our hearts. We share with others in order to to bring up questions or to answer questions. However, some of these reasons don't always apply when we talk with God. For instance, you know, if Part of conversation with other individuals is to communicate information. What in the world can we possibly tell God that God doesn't already know? Hey, God, did you know that I didn't have a real good night's sleep last night? Oh, you didn't? Well, let me tell you that I did. 
just in case you wanted to know. I mean, what doesn't God already know, right? I mean, that's why Jesus pointed out, he said, your father knows what you need even before you ask. God the Father knows all our needs before we ask him. God knows all of our desires. He knows our troubles. He knows all about us. So when we pray and share our hearts with God, it's not as if we're informing God of something that he doesn't already know. This reminds me, anyway, that we don't pray to fulfill some need that God has as if he's lacking. Oh, I didn't know that. No, not not true at all. God knows all our needs. So prayer expresses our dependence on God. Now, when you think about uh, dependence, um, whether we acknowledge God or not, man always seems to have this difficulty with it. We like being independent. But we see even when God created the first man, how, how the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Man has always depended on God. We, even as unbelievers, have a dependency on God. Look closely at this verse and tell me, when did man become a living being? When God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, right? We didn't come from a single cell amoeba crawling out of the water, going over billions and billions of years to get where we are today. God breathes the breath of life into man. God continues to hold that breath of life in, in our lives. And when he decides to remove that, we go into his presence. We're always dependent on God. That's why Job had said, in his hands is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. There are other things that man is dependent upon God beside the breath of life, but the point is, from the very beginning of creation, when man was first created, man has always been dependent on God. Which, herein lies the problem, right? Because ever since the fall of man, Ever since sin entered the world, man has sought independence from God. I suppose that you can make a case uh, that the temptation in the garden was an act of man's independence. As people in America, we value independence, don't we? I mean, we fought for it during the Revolutionary War. We fought for it during the Civil War. We passed laws in our government that secures our rights to be independent. And we have this tendency, it seems, to view independence as a strength. Independence is a weakness. But I have to tell you, dependence upon God is not a weakness. It's a strength. It's a strength. It's a place of strength. As the author of Hebrews states, dependence on God is an anchor for our soul that is firm, that is secure. He says we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. This is not weakness, is it? This is strength. The anchor for our soul is something that keeps us firm and secure. What it does is it helps keep us from drifting from God aimlessly. It keeps us secure. It keeps us connected. It keeps us focused. That's why someone had once said that prayer is simply turning, uh, the turning of the soul to God. If you are turning to God, that means you're turning away from something, right? And as you turn, so does your focus. And where should your focus be placed? It should be placed on Almighty God. Keeping our focus on God is, has always, always been essential for God's people. 
In fact, it is one of the major distinctions between those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. Those who are not in Christ are not going to keep their focus on God. But for those that are in Christ, that's where our focus should be. Now, that does not mean that uh, if you are in Christ, you are incapable of ever moving your focus off God and placing it on something else, although I really wish that were the case. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, David entrusts to his worship leader a great psalm of praise because the Ark of the Covenant had been returned to Israel. It had been taken by a bunch of pagans, but God worked it out so that it would return to his people. And David then commands to the people, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Look at this. Where, where are we to look? To the Lord. Where should our focus be? It should be on the Lord. Why? Because we are dependent on him. As we look at the Lord, what keeps us from drifting? His strength. His strength. Not my strength, his strength. That's why we are dependent on him. Therefore, if we don't want to drift from God, we should seek his face always. Which is the equivalent of Paul sharing that we should pray without ceasing. We should pray always. In Psalm 27, verse 8, David seems to understand the importance of staying connected with God when he says, my heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Now, let me refer back to my definition of prayer. Prayer is the communicational aspect of our relationship with God whereby we share our heart with him. And this communication aspect of our relationship with God is deep, right? It is personal. From deep within his soul, David's heart tells him to seek God's face. The very core of his being, he knows that this is something that he must do. And therefore, he commits to doing it. It's important to him. It's important to him because he depends on God. Dependence upon God keeps us from drifting. You know, at times, I have heard individuals say that are having difficulty with some kind of circumstance in life that they feel as though God has, has left them, that God has drifted away from them. And again, that, those kind of feelings usually come about as a result of, of some kind of enormous trial or circumstance or adversity that someone may be facing. And usually this, uh, this, these kinds of situations almost become overwhelming for the individuals. But you know, you can't always trust your feelings, can you? I mean, feelings are real. We have emotions and so on. But feelings are not always good indicators of truth. And the truth is God never drifts from us. Never. The author of Hebrews says this, he said, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Does that sound like God drifts from us? I don't think so. He's applying a promise that God made to Moses, as recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, where God says, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. What did Jesus say before he ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father? He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely take it to the bank. I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'll be with you till I come back again. His attention is always focused on those who are his. God doesn't shift his focus off of us like we do with him. God never becomes too busy for us. 
He never fills his time with so many things that he has no time for us any longer. He can always squeeze us into his schedule. He always makes you and I a priority. God doesn't drift away from us. It's you and I who drift away from him. Prayer expresses our dependence on God. Our dependence on God keeps us from drifting. And dependence upon God keeps us secure. Secure. In 2 Samuel, David thanks God for everything. For delivering him from his enemies. And since God called him to serve as king, David maintains this, this high constant dependence upon God. And notice, notice how he views his dependence in chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent men, you save me. What a declaration. What a declaration. This declaration came to be known as Psalm 18. And I love how the psalmist begins this psalm. He says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. My strength. Does that sound like a declaration of independence <laughs> to you? To me, it sounds like one that has a high degree of dependence. And, and then he goes on to say, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He's my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Think about it. He describes God as his rock. Literally, he's referring to kind of a cleft in the rock, a little cave or a little... Uh, indentation there in the rock that has an opening and a cleft in a rock always provides security, safety, protection. He calls God a fortress. A fortress gives the impression of safety and protection. Ancient cities had walls built around them, high walls. That was called a fortress to protect the citizens. David calls God his deliverer. A deliverer is one who rescues you, rescues you from harm and from danger. In God, David finds his refuge, his safety, his shelter, his assistance. He says God is his horn of salvation. In the Bible, horns represent a number of different things, but here they're a symbol of victory and power and strength. Dun, 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 dun. That's my God. Finally, he refers to God as a stronghold. A stronghold is a defensive structure that provides safety when one is under attack. You think you're ever under attack from the enemy? Don't be duped into thinking that you're not. But God's our stronghold. All these descriptive terms reflect David's dependency upon God. All reflect the security that we have in Christ. Interestingly, later in both 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18, David mentions how God keeps my way secure secure listen dependence on god is not a state of weakness it is one of strength it's a place of strength i love what david says in psalm 62 verses 7 through 8 he uses many of the same terms that he used in psalm 18 he says my salvation and my honor depend on god he is my mighty rock my refuge trust in him at all times O people pour out your hearts to him for god is our refuge then he mentions 
God is his mighty rock and his refuge. But also notice how he says, my salvation and my honor depend on whom? Pastor Jerry, leadership at First Baptist Church, your mama or papa, you? <laughs> no way. My salvation and my honor depend on God. Honor means approval or distinction. And David honors uh, God by realizing that his salvation is not on because of anything that he has done or because of his worth, worthiness. It's dependent on God. Is that a statement of independence? No, no. He tells us people, trust in him at all times. Why? God's certainly trustworthy, don't you think? Finally, he says, oh, people, pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. God is our refuge. Again, our definition of prayer. Prayer is the communication aspect of our relationship with God whereby we share our hearts with him, something deep, something that is personal. Would any wonder why David would say, hey, people, pour out your hearts to him. Prayer is an important element of our relationship with Almighty God. How's your prayer life? Prayer is important because it expresses our dependence on God. How's your prayer life? Our dependence on God keeps us from drifting. How's your prayer life? I wish you'd quit saying that. Our dependence on God keeps us secure. How's your prayer life? As we spend time together, why not begin practicing this essential element of our relationship with God? Pour your hearts out to him. Your, your honor, your salvation depend upon him. May your hearts during this time give him the thanks, praise, and glory that he is due. Let's pray as the Spirit leads.
Before we're dismissed, let's sing a praise to God one more by lifting up the name, the precious name of Jesus. Would you stand and join me as we sing your name? I like to breathe, don't you? May you pray in the same fashion as you go live out your faith. God bless you. You're dismissed.